right? All right. So now we have to look at how we're going to evaluate logistic regression. So how would you evaluate logistic regression? I evaluate mean like, tell me how good this model is. In this example, in my default, not default example, what metric would you create? So, in we have the root mean square error in the logistic, uh, in, in linear regression, right? That is a, a measure of how well or how much error my model produced. So, how, how would we do the same thing in this model? Correct and incorrect. Right? That's one way of doing it, which is like, okay, I had to predict 100 customers, right? Um, look at this. I said, what how do we, I'm sorry? So, look at it, okay, right? how many predictions of something belonging to a particular class were correct or incorrect, right? So here is one approach. Let's take a binary response variable example, right? Default or not default. Now test a set of 100 observations. There are, uh, we, um, this is the y actual, right? So actually there were 80 zeros, 80 not default and 20 default, right? This is my, and my, what my model predicted was 70 of the predictions uh, were correct, correct. 70 out of 100 were correct. My accuracy is 70 percent. That's what you were also thinking of, right? Let's consider this now. But I got 60 out of 80 of the not default correct, but only 10 out of 20 for the default correct. I'll have to like have the same values, but it's not like no. So the point here is that my model did well in predicting people who did not default. It did, what, 6 out of 8 is 70, it put the accuracy was 75, 78%, right? But it only had an accuracy of 50% when it predicted, when it had to predict how many people did default. But overall my accuracy is still 70. So what the point I'm trying to make is that measure is not a great measure because of this issue. We have to be more granular, right? So our overall accuracy measure does not do justice. You guys are understanding why? Do you want to re explain that part? Because it's explaining only one part. Correct. What we found was, okay, it only, it explained only the people who did not default correctly. But as a bank, wouldn't I want this to be very high? Yeah. Right? So it's not doing the justice of the world. Did you do the same thing in the type one error when you asked that which is better type And then you brought up true positive and yeah. false positive. And today we're going to talk about true positive and false positive. To tackle this issue, right, to have a better measure, right? We use the concepts of precision and recall. The formula for precision is this, which is true positives, the amount of true positives, and true positive is, I'll say two ways. One is where it's me, is the amount of positive examples, right? Uh, ones, we correctly predict. How many uh, predictions of mine were truly positive? Right? Think of that. Divided by true positive plus false positive. A false positive is I incorrectly predicted that he was going to default, for example. So what does precision say? In my denominator, I have the total amount of positive predictions my model had. In the numerator, I have the total amount of correct positive predictions my model had. Right? So the false positive in that case is 20, right? So we'll take a look in the next model we'll bring it up. But here, um, two positives I had were uh, 10, okay. right? 10 and false positive were also 10. So it comes to 10 out of 20, right? False positive is... Uh, it's 10, right? No, the definition false positive means... The, the definition is to falsely predict a positive class. Positive in our case is class 1. I falsely predicted he was going to. So actually, it, he belonged to class zero. Okay. But I predicted he belonged to class one. That's a false positive. So I uh, falsely predicted he was going to default. Actually, he was going to not default. That's a false positive. So people who didn't default. People know, it's, it's, it is a measure of my model. It's not a measure of what actually happened. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In, in reference to the question, I'm trying to understand what is false positive. So, false positive is, uh, as I'm saying, let's say my troop, um, my task is to predict default or non-default, right? There are some predictions 
I get right. That means I, out of the 20 people that were going to default, I that I predicted 10 of them correctly. So my right. So 10 of them were true positive, okay. right? Um, but there were uh, other people, and they were. But I also had I also predicted people who were going to default who actually did not default, right? So that's a false positive. The other ten. Correct. The other ten. I sh I sh I should have said um, that they are not going to default, right? Because they didn't. But I said that they did. We'll do any. We'll we have the once I have the numbers out, it will be easier. So precision, you can think of, is a measure of how right your positive predictions were. Right. Recall is true positive over true positive. The only thing we're changing is false negative. A false negative, a false positive is predicting class 1 when actually the customer belonged to class 0. What would false negative be? That way, the opposite. Right? Your head hurts. <laughs> a false negative means that I falsely <laughs> predicted negative. I falsely predicted he belonged to class 0. In fact, he belonged to class 1. So I falsely predicted he was going to not default, but he did. So as a bank, don't I want my false negatives to be as low as possible? Right? I want to get all the defaulters, right? Okay. So with this formula in mind, uh, we can interpret precision as a measure of result relevancy. How relevant were my results? While recall is a measure of how many truly relevant results are returned. Stare at that formula for a bit and think about what it is. How, how do we increase recall and, uh, recall and decrease the precision? So, we are going to talk about that. All these, these are great questions. Ideally, you want both that precision and recall to be as high as possible. That is dumb of me right now. High as possible. However, there is a trade-off. Think uh, about it, right? Tell me looking Actually, at the in the previous example. Yes. Uh, P uh, happens to be 0 0.5 as per 10 by 20. And R happens to be also 0 0.5, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I think so. False negative is the opposite of false positive. It's yes. 10 again. Yes. But that's a good question. Now, so given, given what you just said, can you tell me why there is a trade-off? Why if I increase one, the other should decrease. Look, and the answer is in the e equations. No, because if something is a false negative, right, there are, these are mutually explosive terms. So, if I have more false negatives, right, uh, that means I must have um, less false positives, right? Yeah, that's saying, true, yeah. I'm saying uh, plus fn is equals to the total number, that's why if you have one less, Correct. Right. So by the denominators, the trade-off is clear. Right. But we want to ideally have them as high as possible. And this trade-off and this trade-off is easy to observe in something we call a confusion matrix. Right. So this is a confusion matrix. Right. So this is how it sets it up. So predicted no, yes. Actual no, yes. Right. So let's look at this is an example where we have let's say one sixty-five observations we are predicting. So let's go along actually I predicted no. Sorry actually no. actually the answer was no and I predicted no. That's a true negative, right? I truly predicted then it was negative. Right? I have these many. Okay. Actually the answer was no but where's that thing? And but I predicted yes. That's the false positive, right? I predicted he was going to default but actually he was never going to default. Then I have actually yes and predicted no. This is a false negative, right? I predicted, I falsely predicted a negative class, whereas actually he belonged to a positive class. And here is my actually yes and predicted yes. So if I if you think about this as a matrix, right? And it is actually a matrix, the diagonal, this is the amount of things you get right. Right? Two positive two negatives and two positives. This is the amount you get wrong. Yeah. Now 
there is actually four ways of measuring the error in a digital company. I'm only talking about three. Because the fourth one is like, it was a bit of calculus. Basically, in every, every model, we have something called a loss and a cost function, right? A loss function is kind of like the loss, the, the loss on each, so the error on each observation. But a cost function is the addition of all that, right? So there is a cost function that the used regression has, and if you want, I can talk about that, and the like derivation of that. Basically, it gives you a number, a floating point number. Kind of like RMSC, you want to get it as low as possible. But these are probably more interp easily interpretable ways of getting the results, okay. right? But how you would see that people mostly talk about and report uh, any cl any classification data set you have, whether you use logistic regression or you use... So this confusion matrix, right, and these concepts of precision recall, they are not specific to logistic regression. Any classification problem you have can use this, right? There's no reason, I mean, can you, there's no reason why you can't use this. It's just a classification problem, right? Same with any nu numerical problem. You use RMSC, you have your, whether you use random forest or you use linear regression, right? You want to know how far away your prediction was from the actual um, observation. But how it is reported mostly,